Uh, my name's uh, Adam Bennett, I'm from High Life Entertainment in Auckland. Some of you guys might have heard about us. Been around for uh, 17 years, um, throwing some pretty wicked parties and music festivals over that time, <coughs> mainly in the, in the uh, Auckland region. Um, just want to say um, it's great to see you guys all here. You know, when I was your age, um, I probably, I wasn't actually, wouldn't be sitting where you guys are. I was more kind of wanting to just party and, and just enjoy life and out there skating and all that stuff. So it's good to see you guys kind of still doing your thing at school and, and getting into that entrepreneurial sort of vibe and, and doing what you got to do to um, keep shooting forward, you know. Um, so I thought um, today I'd just start off, go back a few years um, to, to kind of where I started kind of getting a bit of an entrepreneurial kind of spirit within me and, and, and doing what I kind of do. Um, and, uh, you know, and that goes way back to when I was, um, you know, eight years old. And back then, um, my granddad, he owned these amazing vineyards. And um, um, at the time, my parents didn't really um, give me too much, you know, to, you know, you didn't get much pocket money and stuff like that. So I was like talking to my granddad, like, how can I earn some extra money? And he was like, okay, you know, how about, you know, you take some of these oranges and Fijos and stuff, and then you go and like, you know, s you know sell them back in Takapuna because he had the, Kumu, uh, the orchards up in Kumu. And back in those days, like, Kumu was quite far away. These days it's not, you know. Um, but, um, um, but anyway, so I started selling those on the side of the road and going around and knocking on my neighbor's doors and selling them off. And he'd take his cut and I'd get mine. And then I used to get some extra change and stuff. And that used to go towards all the video games and stuff we used to play, you know. Um, and then... From that, you know, I only used to go out there every couple of months and stuff, you know, usually during school holidays or whatever. And, and from that, um, you know, I kind of was thinking, man, you know, I'm not getting enough cash fast enough. So how can I like, you know, generate some more income while I'm on the ground here, you know? So I actually started going around knocking on my neighbor's doors and stuff that I knew had fruit trees and started getting fruit off their trees locally and then getting that, you know, selling their fruit, cutting them on a deal or some of it I'd just get for free and then you know, go out there and sell that and just get it some extra money, you know. So I think, um, you know, that kind of um, thing, my, my dad was always in sales and stuff and, and, and my mum was kind of in that zone as well and that kind of helped push me into that kind of thing and they just kind of encouraged me when I was young to get in these sort of activities, you know, getting a store on your, outside, of, you know, on the, on the street and stuff and whatever. And back in those days, there was quite a few people doing it. Now and these days you see a few kids and stuff like that that are doing it, but, you know, not as many, you know. Um, from there, you know, I went to, um, um, uh, you know, went to school and stuff. I was in primary school and whatever, and, and then I went to, um, uh, not so long after that, went to Rosmini College. See the Rosmini boys at the front row here, you know, up the front there with their Bibles, which is cool. And um, um, anyway, so I, I, um, I went there, but to be honest, guys, like school wasn't my thing, man. I was a real rebel at school, you know, I just wasn't into it and never... You know, I just, well, I don't know, it was just something about me. I just wasn't into, to, you know, the, the whole system, especially an all-boys school. You know, nothing wrong with that. But back then it was like hardcore Catholic, all-boys sort of thing. And it just wasn't my, my vibe, you know. And um, we, um, back in those days at Rosie, um, I used to, the whole time I was kind of a little bit of a class clown, disruptive and stuff. And, you know, more into just, you know, socializing rather than learning, you know. Um, and what happened was, you know, started just getting up to mischief within school. I went there for form one, two, and three, and we had these card systems back then, you know? And if you had a blue card, it meant you were doing really, you get a card at the end of each week. You'd have a blue card. Do you guys have that system now? you still got it. They bring it back. I heard they got rid of it, now they brought it back. Oh my God. So we had a blue card. If you were a really good, good like student, you get a blue card each week. And if you were just like, all right, and you hadn't gotten too much trouble or anything, but you hadn't been like, you know, the, the teacher's pet, you know, you get a white card, you know. But if you'd like got two crosses, you'd get a red card. And I'm telling you, man, after like a year or two at that school, I had enough red cards to wallpaper my bedroom, you know. <laughs> and um, and so like, and at, and at the time, and, and you know, I don't know how you guys relate to it, but it does put pressure on you because like, I remember the weeks so I was like, okay, I'm really gonna try and give it a good shot. But if you just slipped up a little bit, man, you get that X. They were giving Xs to me like, no tomorrow. And then um, you get the red card, and I'd be like, oh man, you know. But anyway, so. I think like, you know, school there didn't really work out for me and it was coming into form three and I think from memory I got exited from that school over um, some fireworks in, in a classroom or something like that, <laughs> you know, with a German teacher I didn't really like it at the time. It was funny when I did it but, you know, looking back there was probably a few health and safety things there that I should have probably thought about. <laughs> then I went to take a bit of grammar 
And that was in like, um, like beginning of third form when I started there. And I was like, man, this is cool because Taka Grammar had like boys and girls and had a way more social atmosphere. And, you know, and probably a little bit too social. Uh, but, um, you know, I was just like still not into the zone of learning. Like in school, it just wasn't for me. I d definitely think it's for a lot of people. You know, some people, you want to be a lawyer, a doctor, or, you know, certain things, you've got to go through the system and go that way and whatever and, and get your, you know, your e education. But for me, it just didn't, you know, I just couldn't get there. And, and because I was a class clown and stuff, some of the teachers, instead of putting time into helping me, they were just kind of like, you know, shoving me away and stuff. And they're like, you're not going to be anything and, you know, blah, blah, blah and all this. So anyway, early fifth form before school C, I left school. I was like, this isn't for me. I've got to go out and do something else. So I went out and started getting a job like washing dishes and did and washed dishes for years and then I went and did some hospital courses and this is when I fully like got into like you know started getting into that hospitality stuff which which set the kind of ground base um for me when I was um like get, you know for where I am today but anyway so water uh -huh. so um did a hospital course and from there we learned like waitering and a little bit of chefing and you know all that kind of stuff and um from there I went and worked at like a number of restaurants in Takapuna like we had back in they were like one red dog and grain and grape and and I still had the class clown act going on even through my business career um like the hospital career doing all that stuff and it, you know I was like washing dishes and doing all those kind of jobs but I was never really like I was just doing it to earn some paper and then like during that time yeah I was getting some good experience but I never really envisioned like hey this is what I want to do I kind of was but it was kind of like well I've, I've got nothing else I've got to do this and whatever and so it was just kind of pay the bills and during that period though um you know i met a million people and i, I was very sociable back at school you know um and and also in in those years of like hospital and stuff and i when i used to go out on the weekends we used to like i used to know everyone I used to party and north north of you know north side you know south east west central you used to hang out with so many different groups of people and stuff whenever there was a house party I knew about it and I made it like five times bigger. And back in the day, like around Devonport and the shore, we used to have house parties that were like four or five hundred people. I don't think you get that these days because these days the cops are there at like 9 p.m. trying to shut that thing down, you know. But like back in the day, it was like 400 people and there'd be riots and stuff, you know. It'd be like, it'd be crazy. You know, I even got some of that stuff on video. And so um, this is going back to like 96 and 97 and stuff like that, you know. Um, and I just, um, you know, we started, um, after a little while, we were organizing like illegal parties and stuff. We had some like parties on North Head, like down by, down by Lover's Cove. So we had some parties down there. And then we also had some like parties, like people's houses. We, honestly, I threw some wicked parties at people's houses and parents would go away. We'd like Devonport Clifftop properties. They'd get absolutely trashed, but there'd be like 400 kids there just having the meanest time. And back in those days, it was like wicked. We had Tupac playing and it was sick, you know. Um, but anyway... From that, um, we actually hired out a school, uh, like a hall down Basel to Ave, and that was the first time I kind of even looked at from like getting into like selling tickets to a party. And we had some local bands there and stuff, and we had like 400 people turned up, and that was the first kind of gig I did. And I think that was not really like a gig, gig, but it was you know just a local thing. And I think that was in '97 or something like that, you know. Um, anyway, so moving on from there. Um, we, where did we go from there? We went to, um, um, okay, so I started kind of like, I was, I was always like so social, I hang out with heaps of good cats, anything from like really good people and, you know, Christians and skaters and gangsters and you name it, you know, all different kinds of people. I just knew everyone. But uh, there was a period where I was starting to go down the wrong track and hang out with the wrong crowd. And I started getting into, I was partying hard and just getting into that zone and just getting up to mischief and had a few brushes with the law and stuff and like, you know, just stupid things, you know, like we kicked in 50 letterboxes one night and another time we, we did, you know, uh, a liquor ban, we got busted for drinking, you know, and uh, liquor ban areas and just, just things like that, you know, that, but it started mounting up, you know. And um, um, it got to the point where there were certain things happening around me and certain people, you know, thing. And, and this guy I know, he actually used to be like a really, really good dude. Um, and uh, he was in my form class at school and I was actually the class clown. And he was like quite a A grade student, but he was hanging out with another crowd that was actually, you know, bad, pretty bad. I was actually with just an okay crowd, but he started hanging out with a bad crowd. And he ended up, um, when we started getting into our early 20s, you know, like around the age of 20, he, uh, he went missing. 
you know, and they found him like um, he'd been like murdered. And I was thinking to myself then when that happened, that was a turning point in my life when I was like, man, you know what? I was a class clown. Like, that could have been me, you know, like, so I really decided, I was like, you know what? I'm turning my life around. I don't want to be around any of the stuff that's leading in that direction. You know, I want to be going on the up, man. I don't want to be in the space. It's not my space. And I remember like, you know, one day I'd like been washing dishes. I walked out the back and I was like, man, what am I going to do? You know, like I've got nothing. I've got no school education, whatever. My parents even tried to send me back to university and, you know, and I stuffed that up and like, I just had nothing. And I was like, okay, I've got to make some myself, you know? So I went and got three jobs. Um, I um, went and started like, I was waitering at the time when I worked at the nightclubs on K Road and I was portering there like peeling like chewing gum off carpets on Wednesdays and also working in, in the nightclub environment where the big party was going on like doing the classes and stuff and I also start, started selling um, advertising for a magazine called Infusion and back then it was like the small little magazine which was like um, just uh, like a, for the club guide sort of thing and so um, at that time you know um, I was like okay I want to elevate elevate and then like this job came up in the paper. Um, I actually had my 21st, by the way, I put on my 21st birthday party at the power station. We had like 1500 people turn up, which was pretty epic. And then, um, 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 and then I actually had another party in Devonport afterwards, but I won't go into that. But um, then um, what happened was um, this ad came up at Pulp Magazine. Now Pulp Magazine back in the day doesn't exist anymore, but it used to be like Remax, but Remix Magazine, but a bit more funkier and a um, bit more surfy and skatey. There was a job that came up in the newspaper and so I got my friend at that random Fusion magazine to like give me like a, an overinflated reference so I could get in and get this job. And, and I went and saw the recruitment lady and gave her like my kind of spiel and whatever. And she was like, look, I think you're a rusty diamond, but I think you've got potential. And so, you know, let's get you into this. So I dropped the three jobs, went and started working at Pulp magazine and like started doing that full time. And like this was back in like 2000 and beginning of 2002. Um, and so back then, I actually didn't even know how to use Excel when I started doing that job. I really tenaced it. Like when I jumped in there, I was like a fish out of water. And I was like, okay, I got this job. I'm sitting here, whatever. So for the first like year, I actually cracked it. I like, they had a, a mini magazine. I sold out every single issue with all the advertising and everything was cranking. At the end of 2002, I'd only been there a year. At the end of 2002, um, um, my mate that used to own Infusion was like, oh, why don't we do a joint pulp magazine and, and um, Infusion magazine Christmas party? So I was like, oh, yeah, cool. I know a few people. I can bring them along. We did a part Christmas party, you know. It was packed. And he was like, man, you should get into promoting. He was like, oh, man, you know, we just made, like, this much money off the door. Do you want half? And I was like, nah, man, like, you know, I'm, I'm doing this on behalf of the company, so I don't want to, like, take cash. It's not my thing. I want to, you know, I was just in that real zone that I wanted to make sure I do everything straight and narrow from, you know, moving forward. So then, after that, early um, the following year, 2000, I think it was, or maybe later, 2002, I can't remember because uh, it's going back like 17 years now or something, but um, he was like, man, you should get into doing some parties. So I was like, cool. So I started doing these parties. There was a wicked venue we used to have um, back in the day called Coast Bar, and it was actually like just over in the viaduct on top of the, one of the buildings there, this big 360 venue that could hold like about 1,000 people. And um, it was wicked. And um, we did our first party there. And um, we had like a turnout of 2,000 people on our first event. And it was just absolutely packed. And then after that, we did another one at Central. And we just started doing all these parties through end of 2002 and 2003 that were really big. And um, um, at the time, like the guy from all the pulp magazine advertisers saw our parties and they were like, wow, like Sony Ericsson mobile phones. I don't even think they exist anymore. Um, but they were like, well, we're going to sponsor your stuff, you know. And so the owner of Polk came to me after like three months or something or four, six months or something and said, look, you've done some great work for us, but this is becoming a conflict of interest because our advertisers now want to sponsor your events and stuff. And so he was like, you can either stay working for, for us on 35 grand a year and very, very small bonuses, or, you know, you can leave. And I was like, at the time I was like, man, I just put so much work into your business and really passionate about this. I want to stay, but I want to do things. I had to make the choice then to like, you know, do I stay here or do I go? So I decided like, you know what, I'm going to go and give this a shot. And at the time, you know, people were like, nah, man, stay, you know, da, da, da. And then others were like, go. And I was like, nah, I've got to give this a shot, you know. So I went out there, dropped that thing, 
went and um, started my own business. I think I only had like 500 bucks at the time, like, you know, once we'd, because, you know, back then the, the parties were big parties, but we weren't earning that much money off them because it, we didn't have a business mind then. It was just like, let's party. Um, so what we did was we um, uh, started doing the parties and I moved away. I started my own street magazine called Scene Magazine. And back then it was this really good, it evolved. You know, I think we did like two years of it. We were interviewing like G Unit and Exhibit and like, you know, all these different hip hop artists. We had fashion shoots in it, but it was a free mag and it didn't really make that much money. Um, and we we're doing wicked parties and stuff through the club scene. And over a two year period, I was like, man, you know, selling out everything, you know. Um, it got to the stage where um, I started partying quite a bit during the parties and our revenue wasn't going that well and we we're all drinking and stuff and then we started having issues within our events and stuff and I thought I was invincible because I was making all this cash and you know I just knew all these people and then I decided I was going to do this thing out Trust Stadium called the Super Jam and it was a combination of um, uh, like you know hip hop, uh, we brought down like a big rap artist, we had like street ball, we had low rider cars and kickboxing and all this other stuff and I thought hey man this is a really wicked idea and whatever but little did I know that you know people weren't going to get it like it was in my head and and not everything that I touched would turn to gold and then um, on that event I actually this is 2005 um, I'd lost $90,000 so um, looking back it's probably the best $90,000 I've ever spent because it, it taught me a lot and I, I really you know learned a lot from that more than I ever learned in my life from going to university or anything else and then I could, from that loss, I looked at all the different things that I did wrong, you know. Um, and not long before that, I actually built, bought my first property. So at the time of losing that 90 grand, I was like, oh, shit, I'm really like, you know. So I worked my absolute ass off and within 11 months managed to pay the money back to everyone. And people were drilling me at the time. I remember when I, because I was a new promoter then, so people were trying to drag me down. You know, there's, some of these guys just hated that I was like coming up in the game as a new promoter. And when I lost that 90 grand, there were people that they must have been going, yes, this is the end of them. You know, get them out of the industry, you know, because people are like, when it comes to like business, they, a lot of people out there want to tear you down when you're trying on the come up, you know. Um, but anyway, look, I fought through it. You know, I had the creditors on my case, people giving me grief. Some understood, some were like, you know what, that's cool, pay it off over time. Others were like, well, I'm out of money, da da da. I'm like, look, just, I'm gonna give it to you, you know. My grand always said, he was like, you know what, your name's important, man. Like, make sure you pay back every single cent you communicate, because, you know, you can never get your name back once it's been run through the mud, you know. So I stuck to that and I made sure that I just pay back everyone back with interest, you know. Um, I had to make sacrifices. I like moved back into my parents' house, you know, at the time I had like, you know, girlfriend and stuff, so it was pretty hard, like, we had to move back in to get together and stuff and thing, but you have to, like, eat your humble pie when you take your losses. I turned my, my property into an office, rented that out to get some income from that, and just, you know, we worked hard. Um, had to make the call, you know, um, on, on, you know, back then I was like, okay, cool, you know, it's time to, we, we need to, like, turn this stuff into business. We, you know, there's an opportunity here, I've got nothing else, I've got to make this work. So I dropped all the partying, you know, really sharpened up our gigs, uh, really focused on how we think, had to drop some staff, you know, some staff that were just partying and just losing us money and doing stupid things on our events, just had to get rid of this whole party within a party nature and turn it into a promoter journey of us actually creating professional events, you know. Um, what do we do from then? We went to... Um, um, Okay, so I think it was in 2006, um, so we dropped the magazine, we started focusing on um, going into bigger events, we started our own brands. One thing I saw at the time where a lot of people were buying international brands like Slinky and Summer Days and they were bringing them down to New Zealand, they were controlled by the UK and Australians, and they'd put all this hard work in, but it would be the, um, you know, but the Australians could easily just take that brand off you and pass it to another promoter and you'd be like, man, you've just put all this work in your brand. So I've always believed in creating your own brands. Don't buy like someone else's brand or th this is just me. Other people might be able to do things differently. They, they go out and, you know, um, you know, license brands all the time, whatever. But for me, I always wanted to make sure that I was in control of my own brand. So I created our own mu uh, dance party brands and events brand. We had one called Sounds of Summer, which lasted like over 12 years or something, and that was down in Devonport Waterfront at the Masonic. It was wicked. They've just turned that, um, recently just turned the car park into um, uh, apartments. But we used to get like 2,000 down there. Started you know, High Life New Year's Eve. We started that at Stony Ridge Vineyard. That was our first big event. Um, and we did, we've been doing parties and business with Stony Ridge for um, 16 years now, or yeah, thereabouts, I think. 
maybe 15. Um, and then we had another uh, number of other ones um, over the years as well. And as time's gone on, we've dropped some of those brands because I felt like they've come to the end of their run and we've started other ones and we've innovated to keep up with the game. Because if you keep putting out the same shit, people are going to get sick of it, you know? So you always got to innovate, you know? And sometimes it's hard to let go, but you've got to let go so you can like change course, strategize and, you know, keep doing your thing. Um, so um, we started doing these really wicked parties everywhere. Um, the larger events started when we started doing the big New Year's events at Stony Ridge, which were next level. Um, uh, by the time we got to 2007, um, I bought another property. And at the time, even though I was doing some pretty good things in business, I was still partying a bit and not willing to learn. If I had to listen to my mum earlier, she was trying to get me into property a lot earlier. She did get me into property, but if I had learnt about property earlier, I would have made a lot more money and less mistakes. But still, those mistakes helped me to get to where I am today. Um, and property is something else that we do on the side of high life that I'm very passionate about as well, you know? All right, so I'll speed this up. Um, Anyway, so um, from there we got to um, um, 2000, okay, so um, the GFC hit 2008, but during the GFC we did two of our biggest years. We'd gone from earning like, you know, I think profit-wise, I think we're earning like 160 a K a year to 700,000 per year over those years. Um, that's a, that was our profits, you know, after all expenses. Um, from that, we maintained consistency of our profit. We had to make moves in the game. Uh, 2011, we had a really tricky year in business where we had to face a lot of competition in the market. So we changed from an, um, an act-based model where we were trying to get all the big artists and stuff to an experience-based model where we didn't have to rely on big acts to pull the crowds. And we, we went for quality, not quantity. And that's like solidified us in the market today and our reputation where we are. We've got age limits on our events from R20 to R22 dress codes um, and um, you know we pull a really nice good older vibed market and we do most of the top venues around Auckland at the moment um, and um, from there we've we've you know navigated the business through um, to today right now we're transitioning we're, we're looking to drop some of our smaller parties and just focus on these big experiential based festivals like the Takapuna food and wine that you've seen also bring out a um, uh, an amazing outdoor New Year's event this year again. And then we've got a couple of other wicked experiences that we're doing as well. But for us, instead of like trying to do everything, we're just like, you know, you want to do like three or four things incredibly well and generate as much income out of them as you can, especially in a busy market and blah, blah, blah. How's my timing going? Yeah, where are we at now? Oh, two minutes left? Okay, so that's kind of things in a nutshell. Um, any questions? Well, you know what? I just used all the negative stuff that was holding me back to like drive me, you know, to do better, you know, because there was a lot of doubters out there. I had a lot of haters and stuff on my journey because when I was like, you know, and also just everything that, you know, people were like, you're not going to be able to do this or thing that I just used every kind of thing I could to just drive myself forward, you know, and I just take inspiration from a lot of the stuff around me as well, like everything out there to try and bring some really wicked things into this game. So, yeah. But, um, you know. Uh, yeah, man. How did you grow your events over time? Like, how did you make them large over time? So we just, we, we built up our, um, we, we built up our brand over that time and reputation. We gathered, like, databases and stuff like that. We, we made sure that we maintained the quality, you know, people's experience. And it was word of mouth and people having a wicked time that kept gathering the momentum for our events. And it got to a point where we, we'd be selling out every single event. We had years, everything was selling out. You know, most of our stuff still does sell out, apart from when we have to transition to new things and build up a new brand. But um, yeah, if you give people a really awesome experience, you tick all the boxes, you've got enough toilets, you know, you've got enough security, people aren't, you know, aren't fights everywhere, you don't have idiots, you know, getting real drunk and wasted, causing trouble, whatever, you know, all these different factors come into it. Plus we do awesome productions and we bring in an international flavor. We do stuff that's on our events that's a lot different. So if you, we, and we also have this motto of putting the people before the profits, you know, don't, most, a lot of promoters out there, they're always just thinking about their profits. So just put together the most half-assed things, even though they've got a cool act, everything else just goes in, like, goes in their pocket. Whereas I, I believe in reinvesting back into your brand, you know, into the events. Oh, <coughs> uh, yeah, cool, man, yeah. Um, so you mentioned word of mouth a little bit, but how else do you market your company? You're, you're quite a bit of 
Yeah, so um, we market our company through, we've got quite a sizable um, email database, but our key thing these days is social media. And we're lucky because social media is a very crowded space these days and it is harder. If you're starting off a new thing, I believe it is harder, but you have to have a point of difference. And we're luckily that we've had that reputation to carry us through. So when the High Life kind of events come up on Facebook or Insta or wherever, um, we, you know, we're able to get that traction. But we make sure the videos have got an edge and stuff like that and we target, you know, do you know, specific kind of targeting and whatever. But I'd say right now, Facebook, Insta, and email. I mean, sometimes we don't even have to do radio. We do still do a little bit of radio, but you know, more people are kind of on the net listening to things and radio, they're diverging away from that. We don't really do much print media unless we get thrown free stuff. Prints are dead media for, you know, I reckon, but it's digital, man, you just gotta, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, man? Uh, where's the next party at? <laughs> <laughs> Brother, man, you're more than welcome to come along. Um, we're at this stage, we're still deciding if we're going to do winter, but yeah, I think November's going to be the, we're looking at doing something pretty epic. I'm actually looking at doing a pop-up waterfront sort of club restaurant, sort of club experience or something in November. We're still deciding, you know. Out with the old and with the new, that's our, that's our thing, you know. But man, if you want to come, man, holler at me, you know. Yeah, yeah. So like during that time, I'm a big believer in give back, giving back, all right? So the thing is, hey, Andrew, how are you there, Tiger? Good to see he's the next speaker. Give him heaps of grief. Nah. Um, so I believe when you're on your journey, man, if you guys are blessed with opportunity and you're making that paper, you're making that money, you have to give back. Give back to your country, you know, give back to the people that, that are in need and stuff. Like we've, we've, over the years, we do a lot of charitable stuff publicly and behind the scenes. Anywhere from individuals with, the, with cancer or that have like lost their houses in fire, all the way up to, you know, right now we're about to take on, help from uh, organize one of the local school fairs, but we do, you know, support charity, you know, fire stations and this and that and whatever, everything. Auckland, we do a lot of stuff for the homeless in Auckland as well. And so this is the thing, if you're blessed, we're all blessed. If you get the opportunity, if you make that money, there's a lot of people out there that just like make the cash and it goes to the head and they're just like, yeah, let me just spend this on drugs and alcohol and strippers and all that shit. But the thing is, what you got to do, man, if you're blessed with that thing, and I'm thankful, man, I'm telling you, every day I give thanks that I'm like making, you know, where I'm at at the moment. I'm telling you, because I came from nothing, you know? And so if you're blessed with that opportunity, don't let it go to your head. I think you're some Instagram star, any of that kind of crap. Give back to your country. Like, you guys are the next generation, so it's up to you guys to be doing what you can for this country, man. Give something back. It's, it'll bring you good karma. It'll make you feel good too, you know? So, yeah. My biggest learnings, okay, for the business and my personal things. All right, so I think personally, like, I'm learning all the time on trying to make myself a better person, and, like, no one's perfect. We always slip every now and then or whatever, so it's just like a day-to-day -day thing, you know? There's just too many medalists there, my brother. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Punctuality was a big one. I managed to make it today, um, you know, because people's time's important, you know? You don't want to waste people's time. You know, I used to turn up to meetings half an hour late all the time. Looking back, I'm like, oh, my God, you know? And um, so things like that. Biggest business learning, keep your guard up. Because I'm telling you, man, in this game, there's a lot of people out there that don't have integrity, right? Which is another thing that you guys need to try and maintain, integrity and fairness while you're doing business, you know? Um, but yeah, man, it's like you got to keep your guard up because it's a pretty rough world out there. And even you just never know who's going to throw a curveball at you. And trust me, I've had a lot of them over the years, you know? So that's a big learning, you know? Yeah. All good? Thanks for having me, guys. Sweet.